the Lord. Praise God. Let's bow our heads tonight as we want to ask God's blessing upon the session tonight. Amen. Welcome and God bless you. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your privilege, Lord Father, to come into your presence, Lord Father, to come into your courts with praise, Lord. Lord, we gather ourselves, Lord Father, for worship, to hear from you tonight, Lord Father. Lord, we pray that your special presence will come along in a, in a, in a way, a unique way. Bless your children, Lord Father, those that are hooked up tonight, Lord. Lord, that we long to hear from you, Father, your voice, Lord, won't you speak to us tonight? Lord, we pray you anoint us, Lord, bless us as we sing and as we enter into worship now for a minute, a little while, Lord, we pray that you come by and, Lord, touch our hearts, Lord, may you bless, Lord, Father, what has prepared to be said, Lord, through the Bible study tonight, Lord, and we pray that, Lord, it would just bless our hearts, Lord, Father, and help us to see you, Lord, Father, to understand your word, oh, Lord, Father, and to Lord, to to Lord to uh, come into that place, Lord, that you want us to be, Lord Father, Lord, concerning your your word, Lord Father, what you require of us, Lord, in this last day. Grant it, Almighty God. Now we pray these things, Lord, that you'd fulfill it in your name. Amen and amen. Praise be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's just give him praise tonight. Hallowed be thy name, Jehovah God, you are, and you will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same. Let's change that key. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign, and you will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same, oh, hallowed be thy name, O oh Lord. Jehovah God, you reign. Oh, and you will name your Lord. Forever you're the same. You believe it tonight? Hallelujah. Oh, Jehovah, I You supply my every need. Jehovah Rapha, perfect help you give to me. Oh, hallowed be thy name, O oh, Lord. Jehovah God, you reign. Oh, and you will never change. Oh Lord, forever you're the same. Oh, give him praise tonight. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. oh, oh Lord, Jehovah God, you reign. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And you will never change. Forever you're the same Oh, and you will never change, oh Lord Forever you're the same Oh, give him praise tonight, hallelujah Glory to God, thank you, Jesus Hallowed be thy name, Lord In all the earth Amen and amen. Glory to God. Amen, amen. Glory to God. We praise His name, His wonderful name. We praise His name, His wonderful name. Oh, His name is to be praised. We praise His name, His name is to be praised. We praise His name. Oh, we praise His name. 
his wonderful name we praise his name oh his wonderful name oh you name is to be praised we praise his name his name is to be praised we praise his name oh we praise his name his wonderful name oh we praise his name oh his wonderful name oh his name is to be praised we praise his name oh his name is to be praised we praise his name oh his praise oh say the barena oh his praise I wish 
worship you. Oh, lift your hand and sing. Glory to God. Holy, you are holy. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are holy. Holy, you are holy. King of kings. Yesterday from heart surgery. And our mom and siblings are in quarantine as they contracted COVID. She's requesting prayer. And also, want us to pray for Sister Pam and her family, brother Andy Henry and his family also. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. And we pray, dear God, for a special visitation upon this request, Lord, from Sister Ingrid and also from Sister Brother Andy for Sister Pam and her family. Father, may you visit them with your power and healing virtue and strength. May there be a recovery, a speedy recovery, Father. We ask your blessing and your mercy in Jesus' name. And Father, as we approach your word tonight, I pray that your presence will come down in a special way. We can't even qualify or even come near to, to, to think of the magnitude of your mind and your thoughts towards us and your plan and program. How could we speak this tonight? But Lord, we pray you give us the unction, the inspiration, and may the anointing drop down in a special way. Any person sick, Lord, in this virtual room tonight, may they be healed. Any person backslidden, may they be restored. Any person unsaved, may they be saved. Any person in a deliverance, may you deliver them tonight. Take me out of the way, in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen and amen. God bless you and a pleasant night to you. And we are glad to be here tonight. We want to go straight uh, to what we want to share tonight. And, um, you know, Joshua 14, 12, and Caleb says, no, therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord speak in that day. For thou heardest as in the day that the Anakim were there, that the cities were great and fenced. So if so be the Lord will be with me, I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And tonight, I want you to re relax, free yourself tonight, and believe in your heart. Whatever God requires of us, require of you, require of me, we can fulfill it. It can be done. So don't see it as giants. Don't see it as impossible. Say, Lord, if this is what you require of me, there must be a provision me need for me to, to attain it or to get to it. So it's not a matter of um, you want God to come down to your standard. You want to get up to God's standard, to God's requirement. So I would just share something and then we would um, uh, go into what we want to say tonight. Now, what I want to share tonight is what I believe God's vision is of the church. As being a church without spot or wrinkle, washed in his blood. A church, a people made pure. This church is female in designation, called to be the bride. Jesus himself, after asking who women say, I, the son of man am, he told Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. We know in Colossians, it describes he, Jesus, being the head of the body, and this body is called the church. 
that in all things he might have the preeminence. Note, there is no man there. There is no prophet, apostle, teacher, evangelist. He is the head and the body is called the church. Christ being her head, not a man, not a pastor, not the fivefold ministry. Is he is identified as the head of the body called the church. Revelation 21, nine says, they came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talk with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. We're not talking about Baptist church, Methodist church, Pentecostal church. I mean, I mean, the message, we're not talking about that. We're speaking about the bride. Who is she? The lamb's wife, not some pastor wife. The lamb's wife. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife had made herself ready. Made herself ready. Now, the very fact that there's a prophecy over the last day church that sin would not be able to stay in it means that the pendulum of the church, if I could use that analogy, would be moving towards holiness. And my title of tonight's uh, Bible study is A Glorious Church Without Spot or Wrinkle, Holy Without Blemish. That's the title tonight. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle, holy without blemish. Now, God's holiness kept the church pure. Or we can say it this way. God was not going to allow his church to be defiled. And the example of that was when Anas and Sapphira, believers, let's call them baptized believers, came to church. They offer to sell things and bring the money to the church. And when uh, Peter asked, is this all? He said, yes. And they kept back some. It wasn't all. He said, in light of man, you lied to the Holy Ghost. And he fell dead. Here comes his wife. His wife was, she didn't even know her husband died. She came in and they asked the question, was that all? And she, instead of staying with truth, as we said, uh, the unleavened bread of sincerity of truth, she chose to lie just like her husband. She fell down and died. And of course, great fear fell among the believers. And the Bible went on to say, no man joined themselves to that church, but God added to the church such as would be saved. Question. Are we going to go back to that? We have the answer already. Yes. Because he said, I'm Alpha and Omega. So I want you to, to look at it closely tonight. That is the question, dear, is not that the, God wanted to judge Anas and Zafar. The question, dear, was how in the early church, the church was kept clean. And Brother Branham had a great desire in his heart. He longed to walk into a church that sin couldn't stay in it. And he prophesied that there will be a church that sin cannot stay in it. I want you to think about that. So in other words, the way people walk in, in a laissez-faire attitude, um, like anything goes... naked before God, naked before the Holy Ghost. Now that word defile means damage. Uh, uh, are you hearing me clearly? Anybody? Are you hearing me? Anybody could give a wave? Are you hearing me clearly? Okay, I trust, I see a, a message came up about uh, a unsteady internet connection. So I trust them that you're hearing me clearly. So that word defile means uh, to damage the purity or appearance of 
to mar or spoil or desecrate, to make unclean or impure, to corrupt the purity or perfection of, to spoil something or someone so that the thing or person is less beautiful or pure. Let's turn our Bibles tonight. Our first scripture reading would be from Jeremiah chapter 2. We want to read from 1 to 13, and I want to go down after that to 31 to 32. Uh, we take it from there. Let's look at Jeremiah, if your Bible turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, and let's read. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not soon. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruit of his increase. All that devour him shall offend, evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, and have walked after vanity and have become vain? Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us out of the land of Egypt, that led us to the wilderness, to a land of deserts and of pits, to a land of drought and of shadow of death, to a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruits thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine inheritance an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walk after the things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, send unto Kedar, consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Had a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid, be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that could hold no water. Jeremiah, we go down to 31 and 32 of that same chapter, 31 and 32. And this one is an astonishing one to me. In verse 31, he say, O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, we are lords, we will come no more unto thee. In other words, you're your own God. You don't need God. You don't need to seek the Lord. But this is the word I want to get. Can a maid forget her ornament? or a bride her attire, yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And it's powerful how God could describe, can a bride forget her garments? You're getting married and, and you forget all about your garments? He said, my people have forgotten me days without number. So, I want you to see how God sees this relationship between himself and his people. His people as a bride, his people as a church, his people as called by him to be separated unto him. I want you to see that. And I would like to go into Jeremiah chapter three. And I want to, I think I'll read it from the, yeah, Jeremiah chapter, chapter three, read them first, verse one. And I want you to see God's thoughts of the behaviors and attitudes and so on. Just look at, look at this, Jeremiah chapter three and read them verse one. They say, 
If a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another's man, shall he return unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? So you, you see all these scriptures put in relationship, uh, adultery, bad behavior with God's people. So let's go again. They say, if a man put away his wife, she go from him and become another's man, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast been lying with in the ways thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and thy wickedness. So then in the Amplified, that, that chapter, that verse two says, lift up your eyes to bear heights and see where have you not been adulterously laid with? By the wayside, you have sat waiting for lovers, eager for, eager for adul idolatry, like the Arabian desert tribesmen who wait to plunder in the wilderness. And you have polluted the land with your vile harlotry and your wickedness, unfaithfulness, and disobedience to God. This is big. So they said, you, you, you pollute the land with vile harlotry. Your wickedness, and that wickedness is unfaithfulness and disobedience to God. Let's continue verse three. Therefore, the showers have been withholding, and there have been no latter rain. So God is saying, because of the behavior, no showers, no latter rain. For thou hast a whore's forehead and refuses to be ashamed. And it says, therefore, the showers have been withheld, amplified. There has been no spring rain, yet you have the brow of a prostitute. You refuse to be ashamed. Who's for? Will thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, the what? The guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Has thou seen that which backsliding Israel had done? She had gone up from every high mountain and under every tree and had played the harlot. And I said, after she done all these things, turned her unto me, but she returned not. And a treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when all the causes whereby backslide and Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. I had given my bill of divorce. Yet a treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass the likeness of a hoarder that she defiled the land and committing adultery with stones and with stocks. Hallelujah. And yet, for all this, her treacherous sister Judah had not turned unto me with her whole heart, but thickly said, but thickly said the Lord. So, so, so this, this, this one here, that, that not with the whole heart, the Amplified said, but in spite of all of this, a faithless and treacherous sister Judah did not return to me in sincerity and with a whole heart, but only in sheer hypocrisy. Verse 11, and the Lord said unto me, the backsliding Israel had justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will cause my anger to fall upon you, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. That verse 13 says, only know and understand and acknowledge your iniquity and guilt that you have rebelled and transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors among strangers under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. I will take you one of a city and two of a family and I will bring you to Zion. Oh, I feel like praising God right there. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We'll give God some praises. Oh, you could see 
uh, God's passion and, and God's heart, and God is describing it as a woman. And, and, and this, this, this verse here, it is so beautiful. And he says, uh, verse 14, and in the Amplified says, return, O faithless children of the whole 12 tribes, says the Lord, for I am Lord and master and husband to you. I will take you, not as a nation, but individually, one from a city and two from a tribal family, and I will bring you to Zion. Verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And the scriptures in Amplify for that says, and I will give you spiritual shepherds after my own heart in the final time, who would feed you with knowledge and understanding and judgment. May God bless his word. We'll give the Lord some praises right now. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. And here it is, we go to our core text. And it's a familiar text. It's from Ephesians 5. We want to read from verse 22 to 27. Ephesians 5, if you have, a, have it, to the Bible, to Ephesians 5, we want to read from verse 22 to 27. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. So now we just left the Old Testament and showing God making comparisons to woman, wife, I'm your husband, and so on like that. And he seeing them harlotting the self, parading the self, prostituting the self, he still want them to return. Here we're in the New Testament now, Ephesians 5. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, comparison, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's a savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let your wives be to their own husbands in everything. So he is given the clean comparison of the operation of a wife to a husband as Christ and the church. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Reason, purpose, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So I hope tonight that this scripture brings a new meaning to you in the context of what we are presenting, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, reason that he might present it to himself. So in other words, he's not going to leave you as you are. He's not going to pick you up from the world and leave you as you are, worldly, filthy, whatever, that he might present it to himself, what kind of church? This is the vision here now, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, and in between here, or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. That, that blemish is without fault. So this here is the great vision of God. And I know that you might remember, we continue to read this in marriages and in ceremonies, and we're talking about, but this is a great mystery. He's speaking about Christ and the church, yet he's talking about husband and wife. Oh, good to be give the Lord some praises. So I want you to see clearly, that is an objective of this glorious church that God promised in the last days. This church must be presented to himself. This church has to be sanctified and cleansed by the washing of the water by the word. Now let's continue. And, then, and this is where I want to get to an indictment over ministry and a life of holiness. But Abraham, I said, I don't think I am. He said, I want to be a holy. If the Lord ever told me to roll, I guess I would roll. I want to be holy anyhow. To live a life of holiness means cleanness before God. And he said, I condemn the thing. I accuse it. This is indictment. Now, no, this is not brother over the indicting anybody. Okay? Because this indictment is over me, over all the minister, over all the ministry, elders, deacons, it's, it's over. Because brother Barham said, I stand as Jesus Christ attorney. Okay? Listen carefully. I accuse it of crucifying the word of God before the people. Bob here, woman, short wearing, standing up in the choir. Somebody said to me the other day, some woman asked me, said, well, where do you think you'd find? I said, if the Lord asked me to pick a dozen of over the world, I'd be scared to death. When by discernment of the spirit, stand there and watch them stand like that and see them things over there, the dirty, filthy, low down cigarette suckers out there carrying on 
like that and stand in row choir and sing in that condition and let the audience see them, they will say, well, if she can do it, I can too. And here it is. Our Christian life is a life of holiness and purity. I do, I'm not talking about message life. So this is where I want you to think what Caleb said. If the Lord be with me, I shall be able to. A Christian life is a life of holiness and purity. Say it after me. A Christian life is a life of holiness and purity. Let's say one more time. A Christian life is a life of holiness and purity. Give the Lord some praise. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. This is Brother Brown. I indict them in the name of Jesus Christ for their filth and built. They have brought the gospel to a disgrace. And those who try to hold it are called fanatics and say that's old fashioned. I indict them in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, the Bible said that when the spirit and the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against it. And when in this day, with a lot of impersonation, men acting like Christians, pretending to be, it is, and in their heart, as black as the smutty walls of hell, there's many pastoring today that should be out cutting corn or something, be better off. There is men with their theologies and great degrees and things like that, and knows no more about God than a hot and tough knows about Egyptian night. You talk to them about the power of God and the resurrection, they say fanatical preacher. That was in the days gone by. It shows where they are. They don't realize where, what day they are living in. Oh, praise God. And this is closing up this part here. And as my brethren stand here this morning, he's praying. I pray, talk about ministers, each of these ministers here, these ministering spirits, God, hear my prayer. I pray that you will purge that gift that is in them. If they are preachers, make them better preachers. If they are evangelists, make them better evangelists. If they are teachers, make them better teachers. If they are pastors, make them better pastors. God grant that they may be filled with the spirit of God and will be energized with the great super vine that will give them life eternal and power to minister with and to not touch the needy world as it needs today. Oh, could we go give the Lord some praises tonight? So I trust this would kind of help you tonight to see it is not a put on, it is not, this is not the Pentecostal age where it had gifted men, uh, signs, wonders, and miracles, gifted men, and they had no life. That is why God sent a prophet to bring us to work. Okay, the Pentecostal had a great age, 1906, outpouring, dynamic spirit, but it couldn't bring them to adoption. It couldn't bring them to perfection. It couldn't bring them into rapture and fate because they didn't have the word to take them there. Here comes the prophet now with the word, the full word, all the word. And, and tonight, this is what we have to grasp. We have to say, I don't want to be churchy. I don't want to be a church member. I want to be part of this body called the bride. To get in, you need to get in by the spirit. Okay, not by water baptism, but by the baptism of the spirit. The spirit is by one spirit. You see, you can't break the word. By one spirit, we are baptized into the body. And when God put you into that bride body, nobody could take you out. Okay, so let's continue. Praise the Lord. St. John 17, verse 16 to 19. This is Jesus. And Jesus is speaking and speaking about his disciples. Now, these men are men just like you and I, born in sin, shape in iniquity, the following Christ. They are hearing about this kingdom of God. They are hearing about um, not of this world and so on. And Jesus in St. John 17, 16, saying, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them to thy truth. Thy word is true. Now, I want you to see the importance of they being sanctified in order to go forward. Because, see, it come like we born nasty and filth. We, 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 it's muddy. It's dirty. For God to begin to use us, he has to take us and clean us up. 
And then Jesus went further in verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified to the truth. Now, this here is mind-blowing because Jesus was saying, I sanctify myself. I am making that sacrifice that they also may be sanctified. Now, Jesus came sanctified because the Father sanctified Jesus. And that scripture is found in St. John 10. If you want to find it, you could turn to it in John 10, verse 30 to 38. And this is when Jesus dropped the big one on them. In verse 30, he said, and my father are one. That's what Jesus said. It's in John 10, verse 30, and my father are one. Then Jesus took up stones against, again, again to stone him. The Jews, sorry. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them and said, many good works have I showed you from my father. From which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of the Lord came, to, came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, listen Jesus was on, say ye of him, whom the father had sanctified and sent him into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the son of God. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that he may know and believe that the father is in me and I am him. So Jesus said clearly here in this scripture, verse 36, whom the father had sanctified and sent him into the world. So Jesus was sanctified, came to the earth, and he said, I sanctify myself for your sake, that you also may be sanctified. And he went on further and said, as my father sent me, so send I you. And this brings us now to Romans 12. There's a familiar one, Romans 12, one and two, I beseech you therefore brethren, this is not sinners, this is not rum drinkers, and this is not party goers, this is brethren. I beseech you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Okay, so from the Jewish tradition, they know what sacrifice is. You take a lamb, you take a bullock, you take a goat, you put it on the altar, you kill the sacrifice, it's an offering unto God, and we know that that was being done until that perfect lamb came, right? And here is Paul saying, we're not talking about no dead sacrifice. We are talking about a living sacrifice. And we're talking about your body, your body. Present your body, a living sacrifice. In other words, your entire being on the altar of God as a living sacrifice. How holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And maybe let me just take a quick look at this in the Amplified and see what it says here. Praise the Lord. In the meantime, you just give God a praise offering. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so I want to read this in Amplified. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make, listen, a decisive dedication of your bodies, pre presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. So we go back to uh, the regular scripture, verse two, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, unacceptable and perfect will of God. The Amplified says, do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashion after, and adapted to the external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude so that you may prove for yourself what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God 
even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So tonight, by sharing these thoughts, by sharing these things, this bring a fresh infusion into your mind as to what God, how God wants us to live, how God wants us to treat each other, how God wants us to come into his presence, how God, and, and we said, uh, one of the things that separate the God we serve from everything else is his holiness. And, and we cannot say wear white clothes and, 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 and buckle up everything to the neck and to the, 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 the arms and, and say that is holiness or we don't do and don't do and keeping laws, that is not holiness. Holiness is when God's presence could be revealed to you. It, it, it is his holiness, not our holiness. We don't have holiness. I think the last lesson that we shared with you about the beauty of holiness, uh, the key scripture there was Isaiah coming into presence and God let Uzziah fall and ministry crash as king. And Isaiah shook up, went into the temple and began to cry out unto God. He's a prophet because I'm speaking the word, speaking for God. Isaiah put out 66 books, Isaiah. And here it is when he come into presence, he, he saw the seraphs, he saw the burners. He said, woe is me. When you come into presence, it's not woe is you and you and blaming this one and accusing this one. No, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. It brings you so conscious of your littleness. It makes you so conscious of how small you are in presence. So when you see somebody in arrogance and nobody can talk to them and tell them anything, you know they ain't come into presence yet. Because when this presence hit Brother Brown and he was in a corner somewhere, he said for days, he was numb. He said, you know, the blessings of God, but you know the power of God. When John fell, he fell as one dead. He knew Jesus in the flesh, but that presence, that Daniel fell. All these brothers, one reaction, one behavior, Moses, take off your shoes. The place you stand is holy ground. So God revealed himself from a level of holiness. And I don't, if anybody think we best preach in sanctification, holiness, and like, you know, this is not a mess and whatnot. They are ignorant, let them be ignorant. If the intellectual stupidity, just leave them into intellectual stupidity. This is what God went to have, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. As I said, if the church is moving towards no sin or where sin cannot stay in the church, it is only because of his holiness. You know what he did by, by judging that Nas and Sapphira? He kept the church holy. Could somebody say amen? He kept the church pure. Because if that is allowed, the church will come corrupt. What was the message a couple of Sundays about? The unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Because you see, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And if rottenness starts to come in, it will rotten the whole group, it will rotten the whole church, it will rotten the right body. So God has to get the leaven out. So God will drop some bombs to rock off and blow out the rocks that do offend off of his holy mountain. God will move out ministers. God will move out elders. God will move out deacons, ushers, people, individuals. God wants to shift things around so that this will come to pass. His holiness, his presence, his power will prevail. You see it in the, in the deep call to deep. But Abraham preach. You come say, you know what I'm waiting on? I don't know if you'll come. I don't know if you'll be here. I'm waiting on the angel of the Lord. He's waiting. He's waiting. And when the angel entered into the room, he said, he is here. Now, I think his brother Billy Paul gave a testimony. And of Brother Abraham says, Billy, you know, something about wanting to see the angel. He wanted Brother Billy Paul to see the angel or whatnot. And he put a pillow. I, I may not get the story altogether in detail that way. He put a pillow over Billy Paul's head and said, you know where the sink is at or the basin is at or something like that. I want you to look there. He's standing there. And then he, he moves the, the pillow. And when Brother Billy Paul looks, he sees a man standing there. He can describe him and that presence. And Brother Billy Paul gave a testimony that since that experience, he always knew when the angel came. So 
it appears as if because Brother Billy Paul had to work with Brother Branham in the ministry of the spirit, I'll say it that way, he had was to be aware of and be conscious of when this being or this angel came into the room. So he said, before even Brother Ram said it, he will know the angel is there. And when the angel came among the people, you would hear Brahm say, I take every spirit under my control for the glory of God. Because he knew, William Branham knew, that the full authority of heaven was behind him then. So there's not a demon could challenge that. Not when Michael is there. Not when the angel is there. Not when that power is there. And that same thing will be applied to the last day church. That same thing will be applied to the adopted sons. That same thing will be applied to the apostolic church. Because believe you me, there is going to be an apostolic church in the last days. Apostolic church. And, and, and that is why you will get apostolic conditions. That is why you could hear about when the press come down. There is no press if there's no apostolic church. It doesn't make any sense. What they're going to press us for? For books and tapes? Absolutely not. The only way press could come is because Jesus Christ, the original grain, is being reproduced. And a big bump, he says, the ministry has come to perfection when, when Christ is reproduced in the natural. It's a direct quote. I say it again. The ministry, hey, we talk about ministry and this brother ministry and that brother ministry. And preach a good message and he preaching mysteries and preaching this and preaching that. Fine. But there's a word concerning coming to perfection. Coming to perfection is not more mysteries and more talk. The ministry has come into perfection when Christ is reproduced in natural, not verbal, in natural. That is Christ back on the earth again in human flesh. In other words, the word made flesh. Okay. So we talk about presenting your bodies, a living sacrifice, being on the altar, which is a reasonable service, and, and then your mind being transformed. Now, when Israel came out, something I always refer back to, when Israel came out of Egypt, they don't know who this God is. And we want, when we come out of the world, we get convicted, we want to serve Jesus. We don't know who God is yet. We know God is alive. He, Jesus saved me. I got baptized in Jesus' name. And if you have not got baptized in Jesus' name, you should. If you haven't given your heart to the Lord, you should. Okay? And you shall receive the cancellation of your sins, the remission of your sins, and you shall receive his Holy Ghost. But listen to this. I want to share this with you. And this has to do with setting your mind in order for holiness. You can't repent for what Adam done. You never done it. Adam did it. You just get forgiveness what you have done. The old nature is still there. And then Baraban talk about, here's a human heart. And watch now, this one here have a snake in it, that is sin. And he has his life. This one here has a dove in it, which is the Holy Spirit. And he has a life. Now, one here with the snake in it has malice, hatred, envy. And what's causing it? Well, and the other one have joy, love, long-suffering. And there's a dove that is causing that one. And the other behavior, hatred, envy, is a snake causing it, right? Now, when you ask, and you're forgiven of your sins, you only done this, taking that away. But the thing that make you do it is still there, which is the old root of evil. It is still there. Notice, when you repent and get baptized, in the name of Jesus Christ, he forgives you of your sins. Then, and this is the part we want to get to, then secondly comes sanctification. And listen to this, which sets our mind in order for holiness. Now, if this is not presented, church could just be like a club. Church is a, could be a place where you look for a, a boyfriend or you look for a girlfriend or you look for, you know, some help or some blessing or you look for some, like, some holy water. If, if in other words, you have to begin to see God's mind and God's thoughts, what he wants the people to understand. So that is why God didn't just send Moses to deliver the people. He sent Moses to deliver the people to bring them to the mountain of God that they could hear from God and get instructions to know God, how he lives, what he loves, what, he, what, he, what pleases him. You see? 
So it's not, so we don't want to come down this far and have the God of our own creation. Because people have that, you know. God is a good God all the time, like a phrase. And they're doing their own thing, you know, and I and God so, and they have, you know, like if he's a man just like that. We're not talking about that. I'm not talking about your gods or the God that you create, or I'll just say this way, the God of your imagination. We're not talking about that. You see the scriptures we are reading? We're talking about the God of the Bible, not the God of your interpretation, the God of the scriptures, okay? So, so this is the same thing. So next come, secondly comes sanctification, which sets our mind in order for holiness to think right. Sanctification is a Greek word which means clean, and set aside for service. Next, after sanctification comes the baptism of fire and Holy Ghost that God might dwell in us. And the fire of God cleanses our hearts from sin and puts the Holy Ghost inside. In the natural, when a woman gives birth to a baby, first is blood, water, then blood, then the spirit, the life. And then when a baby is born into the kingdom of God, it comes the same way. Water, blood, spirit. Sanctification, the second stage, cleanses the mind and sets the heart in order of holiness. A man can repent of his sin and a immoral woman he finds a drunkard. Every time he smells the drink, it is still dear. But when he gets sanctified, it cleanses the desire out of him. It takes the want of it away. So if you're a smoker, it takes the want of smoking away. If you're lost enough a woman, it takes that thing away. You can still be tempted, but it takes the want of it away. He's still not right yet. Then he is baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, cleansed, burnt out, and then put into service for God. Oh my, hallelujah. And we... Want to look at, uh, I think we look at the scripture before, First Thessalonians 3, and Paul was talking about night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and that might perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, God himself, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way unto you and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and towards all men, even as we do towards you. And this is, this is something else in genuine Christianity. You cannot be sanctified, close to God, walk in the spirit, and cannot treat your brethren right. Something is wrong. In other words, the life of Christ upon you will cause you to deal right with your fellow man. And I'm not even talking about church folks. I'm talking about all man. I call the Bible say, live peaceably as much as possible with all man. That is the life of God. You're not trying to uh, rile up the government and rile up and, and bring on the press and you want to challenge the system. That, that is foolishness. That is not the life of Christ. Because see, we don't know what extension and time God has given for the last one to come in. The scripture we read where God talking about Harlot and how they prostitute themselves and whatnot, and yet we're looking for them to return and, 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 and to love and I'm your husband. You could see the compassion God deals with, the mercy God deals with. You could see it now why when they caught a woman in adultery, and they quote the law and say, Moses said to stone this woman. And Jesus could, could, could write on the ground and say, which one of you without sin cast the first stone? Woman go and sin no more. You could see how he came to amend the broken heart. You could see how he came to heal the hurt hearts. Now, I know there are people and ministers that manipulate when people fall and sin to control them, hold them under grip. God never did that. When God free you, he say, who the son of man set free is free indeed. I don't care what you have done in your past. I don't care what you have been through. When God free you, you are free. Even the woman at the well, when God freed her, she could tell everybody, come see a man. There's no shame in your past. Your past is your past. Your past will determine your future. Is your choices and decision will determine your future. 
your choice to repent, your choice to get it right, your choice to do the right thing, because thou was chosen. Your decision and your decision tonight in receiving what is being spoken here tonight will affect your future as a Christian, because this is something you accept or reject, not as a thought, but as something to apply. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. So Paul says, and the Lord make to increase and abound in love towards one another and towards all men, even as we do towards you, to the end that he may establish your hearts, one, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Hallelujah. And, and this is um, chapter one, furthermore. Okay. All right, yes, chapter four. This is this is continuation of, I don't think we had read this one. First Thessalonians chapter four, and this is verse one. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so that you are bound more and more. For you know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Now, this is Holy Ghost people talking to you. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And this is the verse I want to get to. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. In other words, you have a choice of how you deal with your body. How you manage the issues in your body. The desires in your flesh. The desires of your spirit. He's saying that everyone is supposed to know their system. What will affect you? What will bother you? Remember the girl, lady who she used to drink and smoke and in the bar and so on. She came to the Lord. She talked to the Lord and whatnot. She's walking on the road one day and something tell her, why, why did you go inside there and testify? And was the devil setting her up? So she going back there. Next minute she on the floor. She messed up. Next minute is demons upon her life because she actually leave her environment and went into the enemy camp, so to speak. So, so in other words, she, if she was aware of her response in going that atmosphere, she never go near there. I guess the way you see sin, you run. When you see drama coming and you can't deal with it, run. That what Joseph did. Potiphar wife make a big move on Joseph and Joseph just run for his life. I guess other brother might say, I ain't running. I sound like a man. And you fall like a man too. Adam fell without one woman, extra woman inside the garden. And he fell. He fell because he disbelieved. Okay? So, so we want to stay straight with that word. So the Bible says here now that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. So Paul, keep compa he, he's comparing, listen, you cannot operate presently as if you were living as in the past. That no man go beyond that before his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, that we have forewarned you and testify. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. In the Amplified, Verse 3 says, this is the will of God, that you should be consecrated, separated, set apart for pure and holy living, that you should abstain and shrink from all sexual vice, that each one of you should know how to possess, control, manage his own body in consecration, purity, separated from things profane and honor. And to be used in the passion of lust like the heathen who are ignorant of the true God and have no knowledge of his will. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I won't keep you alone again. We on the home stretch here now. So the Bible says about Christ, and this is in, I'll skip down chapter five of Hebrews 5, Hebrews, and verse six says, and he also in another place said, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, verse seven, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, Unto him that was able to save him from debt and was heard and that he feared. Here we go, verse eight. Though he was son, yet 
learn the obedience by the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need of one to teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as need of milk, not strong meat. I know we read this before. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use of their senses exercise to discern both good of evil. Oh, praise God. So solid food is for grown men, for those whose senses and mental faculties are trained by practice to discriminate and distinguish between what is morally good and noble and what is evil and contrary either to divine or human law. Now, the life that God wants of us is a life of growth, a life of increase, a life of addition, a life of fruitfulness, a life of multiplication. I think that good saying again tonight. Your life, our life, the life that God wants for us is a life of growth, a life of increase, a life of addition, a life of fruitfulness and multiplication. And this we could draw from Second Peter 1. It's a scripture we are familiar with, but I want you to look again, and I'm going to read it more, mostly from the Amplified, but I'm going to read this, by grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power had given unto us all things. All things. Remember, we are well able to take this land. All things, we are well able to possess this moment. All things that pertain to life and godliness. And the channel is through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby a given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. And this year, and we take off here now, and he amplified, by means of these, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceeding great promises so that through them, you might escape by flight from the moral decay, rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed and become sharers and partakers of his divine nature. So I'm gonna go forward in the Amplified with five, those five. For this reason, adding your diligence to the divine promise, employ every effort, exercising your faith to develop virtue. So in the King James, it's have and to faith, add virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and so on. But listen to how it is placed here. Employ every effort, which is given all diligence, exercising your faith to develop virtue, excellence, resolution, Christian energy, and in exercising virtue, develop knowledge, intelligence, and in exercising knowledge, develop self-control. And in exercising self-control, develop steadfastness, steadfastness, patience, endurance. And in exercising steadfastness, develop godliness, piety. And in exercising godliness, develop brotherly affection. And in exercising brotherly affection, develop Christian love. I like how this is phrased because it shows that you are actually doing something. In, in, in other words, you are applying what you're hearing, giving all diligence, add, add. You're not just sitting down like a lump on a log waiting for things to happen to you. No, you are acting on what God promised. And verse seven says, and in exercising godliness, develop brotherly affection. In exercising brotherly affection, develop Christian love. So how come somebody could claim to have brotherly kindness and there's no exercise of it? No display. When issues come, you still have an ought 
it's not a grudge. You're not excited, brother, can You're just a carnal, natural, normal. You vex, you vex. You're angry, you're angry. Somebody will give you this. And you can't love somebody who treats you badly. You don't know they had a bad day. They get upset and they treat you badly. Yes, they're wrong. They treat you badly. But you are called to develop, to exercise, brotherly love. How much times a day? Did somebody say 70 times seven? They ask you as a question. How much time shall I forgive my brother? 70 times seven? Yes, 70 times seven a day. And when you could exercise in that kind of a way, then it's anchored. You have it, brotherly kindness. You test it. You, you, you experience it. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be of the Lord. All right. For, for as these qualities are yours and increasing upon you, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful into the personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah. Whoever lacked these qualities is blind, spiritually short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him and become oblivious to the fact he was cleansed from his old sin. Hebrews 10, 14. You have to find this one now. Read it. One verse there. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. The Amplified, for by one single offering, he has completely forever, forever completely cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made home. All right, we are the home stretch here. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 11. You can find this one. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Paul speaks. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you, but ye were washed. I read it again. Such were some of you. But he are washed, but he are sanctified, but he are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Be amplified. Let's read. Do you know that the unrighteous and his wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, misled, neither the impure or the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor cheats swindlers and thieves, nor greedy graspers, nor drunkards, nor foul mouth revilers and slanderers, or extortioners and robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. But some of you were once, but you were washed clean, purified by a complete atonement for sin and made free from the guilt of sin. You were consecrated, set apart, hallowed and you were justified pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the lord jesus christ okay first peter so you're running through some scriptures now first peter one verse there first peter one verse two peter speaks elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father true sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be more. I want to pause there a minute. And you know, there's a familiar scripture in Romans 8, we talk about who he phoned, who he called, who he called, he justified, and who he justified, he already glorified. Note in that scripture, it never said anything about sanctifying. Now, justification is of God. And sanctification and, and, and glorification is of God. That is God's job. We can't justify ourselves. We can't glorify, ourse uh, glorify ourselves. But is that sanctification? That sanctification in that slot is where we are at, is what we could work out, is what we could attain or achieve or get to. So let me read this First Peter 1, 2, in the Amplify. Who were chosen and foreknown of God? That's a big deal. Chosen, unknown, and the Father, and consecrated, sanctified, made holy by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ. So we want to bring the sanctification as it connects to obedience. Let me say it again. 
we want to share with you sanctification as it connects to obedience. So consecrated, sanctified, made holy by the spirit to be obedient. And 1 Peter 1.22 says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfake love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Oh my, I could shout here right now because this is genuine Christianity. This is not no game. There's not no going down in church and you come in and you go out and you talk to nobody and you mix it with nobody and you're on your own and you and you have your own problems. No, it's not that. The Amplified. Since by your obedience to the truth, through the Holy Spirit, you have purified your hearts for the sincere affection of the brethren. See that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. And I am almost there. Oh, praise the Lord. Almost there. It's just 14 pages I have, and this is now on page 13. So, you know, we almost there. Hebrews 13, 4. And I want you to find that scripture as we want to wrap up here now. Hebrews 13, 4. That scripture is marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled, but homongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, that word undefiled means pure, spotless, unblemished, unspotted, unsullied, immaculate, or this, this is synonyms, untarnished without a stain. Undefiled means not made corrupt impure or unclean, not made morally impure. Now there has to be a reason that the word was said, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But does undefiled mean anything goes? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Now the reason I'm bringing this because first Peter three, one to seven, the Bible speaks about likewise he wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, own husband, not every man. That if any obey not the word, which is your husband, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation or behavior or life coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be with outward adorning and platinum of hair, a wearing of gold, or putting on apparel. But let it be the hidden man of, man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. Note, sisters, this is the goal. This is the target. Not your clothes, not your shoes, not your hairstyle, but the type of spirit was fight. And after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subject unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters he are, as long as ye do well and not be afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, this is the part I want to get to, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, we are not talking about party going people. We are not talking about uh, carnival people or, or, or going to fete. We're talking about Christians. And here it is, you could see the scriptures identify that things could happen within a relationship and a marriage that prayers are hindered. So I am hoping that what we are sharing here would even clear that up, that you as a husband, you as a wife, a believer, you would operate in such a way because this is not just for marriage now, because you as a single person, you could do things and act in a way that your prayer is hindered. What you want is when you pray, God answers. What you want is when you pray, God honors. This is what you want. You don't want your prayer to be uh, hindered. So when the Bible says marriage is honorable, and the bed is undefiled. It doesn't mean anything goes. 
Because in this age where Hollywood and pornography and everything else want to define what people should do or should not do, God expects us to behave right. And the question, Brother Bram says, if there's a question, don't do it, then you're right. So anytime there come a question in how we're supposed to behave and act in a relationship, once there's a question, don't do it, then you're right. God wants a sanctified life in the truest sense. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. So, Acts 26. And this is about the final we get into it. Acts. Acts. So don't be swayed. There's a lot of things out there that are contrary to God's plan and program. And I'm seeing this. You know, people have an attitude. If the husband and wife agree, then it's okay. Well, if it's not breaking God's law and God's word, suppose the husband and wife agree to the wrong thing. Is it right? No, it's not right. So God doesn't give a free blanket. The bed is on the file. Therefore, we could do what we want. No. Make sure Hollywood and the people out there not directing the show inside your house. Make sure it's not people outside and what people doing outside influencing your life. Acts 26, verse 14 to 18. And when we have fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against bricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Here we go. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, and this verse I want to get to now, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Let me repeat that, let me read that again that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by what? By faith that is in me. And we close with this tonight. Second Corinthians 7, 1. And this captures the part that we have to play to be in this glorious church without spot or wrinkle. This is not the pastor part. And you, you love your pastor. And you, and you know, um, if you stay with your pastor, you see you're true. This is not that. Okay, this is not that. This is Paul, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. And maybe we could read this together. 3, 4. If you find it, 3, 4. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. And he amplified, it says, therefore, since these great promises are ours, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit and bring our consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of God. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Friends, I trust tonight that you get an infusion of how God sees this bride, how God sees his wife, and why the scripture says his wife had made herself ready. There are things that we are called to do. You know, Brother Ram say, make yourself a Christian. He also said, many people say, if God could take this spirit from me and that spirit from me, he said, but there's something you have to do. So when they were coming to the wilderness as we close, they were fed manna, they were fed meat, they were, they were given water on the rock. But when they come into the land, manna ceased, nothing falling from heaven anymore. They had to plant, they had to toil, they had to fight, they had to cut down the ground. He said them little by little, you'll possess the land. I want you tonight to take this crown that was presented tonight little by little. See 
what God requires of the church. He's going to have a glorious church without spot, without wrinkle. Not because I say so, but because he said so. Nothing will stop that church. Just as Anas and Sapphira perished because he was going to keep that church clean, it's come another church that people will die. Just like today, people don't want to apply what is applied to them concerning the coronavirus, they will die. Some will die. Some will get sick. We have a choice. You either be on the side of the virus or the side of the vaccine. There's no in between. I told someone, I said, you could make style by saying you're not taking any vaccine or you're going to chase the You have a choice and you have a choice. Big deal. You could keep your choice. But guess what? You have no choice in getting coronavirus. You can't tell the virus, don't come here. You know. I'm not taking you. You, know. you get it, you deal with it. We have a choice tonight to cleanse ourselves. That is your choice because thou was chosen. Though if you need deliverance, you find yourself driven and you find yourself needing a helping hand, you could see us, you could talk with us, we could pray with you, we could believe God for you and, and pray you through and, and so on. But, 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 but please, don't stay as you are. God, a Christian life, is a life of holiness and purity. Let us bow our heads. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight. This has been a challenging uh, 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 teaching to present. I am in no way worthy to even present this. I stand before you in that scripture of Corinthians cleansing ourselves. I look to be cleansed, to be purified, to be made pure by your fire. But this is your truth, Lord. And this is your truth that must be given to your people. God, as you made me aware of it and quickened it to me, I share it with them. Father, you know every heart gathered here tonight. Lord, may there be a change, Lord. There are people who are tough, who are difficult, who are hard-hearted, who have been coming to church for years, and it seems like there's no change. And sometimes it's difficult for us to look and see that. It is tough to see them in their rebellion, to see them in their bad attitude, not just in church, but towards their husbands, towards wives, towards things in general, and to see a struggle in the human spirit, unsanctified, natural. But tonight we are confronted with your word, with the mirror of your word, with the truth of it. This has nothing to do with group and church and my revelation and this one revelation. This has to do with the purity of your truth. One of the angels having the vials say, come, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And his wife had made herself ready by putting on the clothes of the promised word. Help us tonight, dear God. Peter, identify. It's by these promises we become partakers of his divine nature. And here Paul says, having therefore these precious promises, let us cleanse ourselves. May this be a target, a goal for the ministry, the ministers, the elders, the deacons, the ushers, the trustees, every member in the church, every person here under the song of my voice. May this be a target and goal in their hearts, in their minds, in their spirits to cleanse themselves. Something that God can't do, something that they have to do. Because you couldn't say it in a word and we can't do it. Having therefore these precious promises, let us cleanse ourselves. There is a clean and clear vision, Lord, that this bride will not be brought and presented anyhow. This bride will be presented as a glorious church, a church of people that you'll be proud of, without spot, without wrinkle, holy, without blemish. Bless the people tonight. Bless the service tomorrow that will be streamed. Bless the prayer meeting on Friday. Bless the service this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. I thank you tonight for being such an audience. I, I, I felt you out there, and I pray that God would, would bless you. And I would be sending out the text and the scriptures that I read, what I 
placed there that uh, that you could reflect on it. There's a lot of scriptures that was read, and uh, as you, many of you will be aware, I have not really been an Old Testament preacher, um, but now I'm uh, being attracted to scriptures in the Old Testament that will help guide us here in the New Testament. So God bless you. Have a good night. God be with you.